The Bay Division of Team A is proud to present uh, teaching regularly logically with clinicians Darcy Carter Williams, Jenny E, and Alex Ortega from Styles Middle School in Leander ISD. Darcy Williams is the head director at Styles Middle School. She earned her Bachelor of Music from West Texas A&M and is in her 12th year of teaching. Darcy fans have won the Outstanding Performing Series, played at the Western International Band Clinic in Seattle in 2011, and most recently performed at the Midwest International Bay and Orchestra Clinic in Chicago. They placed third in Team E's class WC honor band in 2015. Jenny E is an assistant band director at Styles Middle School and is in her ninth year of teaching. She graduated from Ithaca College before moving to Texas to teach. Jenny and Darcy have worked together for the last six years, calling the perfect good cop, bad cop teaching style, which you can see today. <laughs> Alex Ortega is also an assistant band director at Styles Middle School. He graduated from Texas State University and is in his third year of teaching and the last two have been at Styles. Alex is a pro at Grand Mountain Styles and Teaching with the Logically this morning will be very exciting for you. It is a fun, easy, and effective approach to teaching rhythm. I think we are going to see that this is a very eclectic staff that has a lot to share with you. There is a lot of personality, and this is proud participation, so we expect you all to participate. We please join me in welcoming Darcy Carter Williams, Alex Ortega, and Jenny Lee. teachers or incoming first year teachers so if you know some that maybe weren't able to come we're going to be putting this on YouTube uh, later this evening um, and you can find that link on our band website this clinic is going to be a lot of things um, but let me start off by telling you what it's not we are not here to debate what the best counting system is because the best counting system is a consistent one um, one that your entire staff percussion instructor included is using um, what we are going to be talking about today is the specific progression um, wording, the pace, and the general regularity with which we are approaching rhythm with our kids at Styles. Um, now I know you're concerned, if I'm doing this much rhythm, when will I play Concert F? And I have to let you know, you're still going to have time for that. Um, we simply believe that rhythm is a fundamental equal to that of tone and articulation and all of the other cool things that we're already drilling um, into our kids on a daily basis. It's worthy of isolation. Counting is not a baby step. Um, you know, you can play with an absolutely gorgeous tone, but if you do it at the wrong time, it's still a wrong note, even if it's a pretty wrong note. Um, a little bit about how we get here. Um, I student taught in the fall, and then got my first teaching job in January. And so I was thrown in with three other directors that had three wildly different counting systems, and um, they were used very minimally and the beginners that I inherited largely played by feel. Your smart kids had already figured it out, um, but I was the fourth director and I was not going to be getting any of those kids in my band, and so I was very concerned. And so towards the end of the first semester, I sat down and asked the other directors, would it be okay if I kind of centralized how we're teaching rhythm? And we did something called Together Days. So I proposed the idea of all of second period band kids coming to me. And I taught all of them how to teach rhythm with the exact same wording at the exact same time so that every kid was getting the exact same rhythm information. And when they gave me the thumbs up for that, I needed a curriculum. So I spent the next three months in my tiny apartment living room floor with absolutely every method book that I could find. I ripped out every single counting chart I could find out of any book that existed. I threw away the stuff that I thought was bad. I kept the stuff that was good. I added a bunch of new material myself. And then I went through and started reorganizing all of this stuff into um, a progression in which every new rhythm was a logical extension of the next. I wanted to make sure that the kids that didn't get it super quick were going to get it. Um, and so then I sat down with my illegally downloaded copy of Finale 2003, and <laughs> I made the set of charts that we still use 12 years later. I've emailed them out to a bunch of my college friends. Leander ISD all uses them. Some of you may have them in your uh, band binders and don't even know they're mine. Um, you can email me and I'm happy to send them to you. Um, the charts that we use are not perfect, but they do a couple of things that most of them don't. Most counting charts do not present in a logical form. They expect little tiny baby beginners to make leaps in their understanding, and we want counting to be extremely easy for them. 
Um, they get complicated super quick, and uh, there's just not a whole lot of material on any one concept for repetition. So mine aren't perfect, but they are better than the alternative. So we start every beginner class every day with one to two minutes of counting. Um, it's every single day. It's something that the kids learn to expect. It's something that they get good at because they're doing it every single day. We are teaching them a new language. They don't know this stuff. And there are things I think we take for granted sometimes because we've been doing it for so long that they plain just don't know. Um, so by doing this every single day, we're reinforcing it. And then once we actually get to instruments, the kids that actually end up struggling on their instrument are starting class with something that they feel good about and something that they can do. And that actually opens them up to um, being more receptive to the information you're giving them later in class on other concepts. We do use the Eastman counting system at Styles, and we also use an eighth note pulse in our voice. Now, I know you're kind of freaking out a little bit uh, because we pulse our voices. However, Darcy and I have been teaching together for six years, um, and that first day we did a together day when our first year together, and I heard the pulsing, and I was like, oh my gosh, they are going to do that when they play. However, uh, we have very big power in our words with our students. They trust us, and all you have to do is tell them not to do it, and they don't. Uh, we do not have a single child that pulses when they play. Uh, to this day, so it works just fine. So this is my second year in Styles and my third year overall, and even though I had good training in college and I had an entire year of experience under my belt, I was not a master teacher by any means by the time I got to Styles. Um, teaching rhythm from scratch is a very difficult thing to do, and although I'm a percussionist, you know, introducing quarter notes, eighth notes, dotted rhythms, was just not very comfortable uh, for me. And so the progression of wording that I used was very different than the wording that Darcy and Jimmy <coughs> used, uh, which I very quickly learned when I hopped on board. Um, I had also never used the Eastman counting system with one tt toss. I had like heard of it, um, and I was like, whatever, that's strange. I only ever <laughs> used one hand. Um, but it was fine, but the quick is switch and easy. And it is for the kids too, which I'll talk about more later on. Um, with teaching brand new rhythms to students, how you place each small word can make a huge difference in the long run. Um, and that's why Darcy has a script, which you'll find in your handout, literally word for word. You know, a script that has word for word how to go through the first day of school. Um, and the difference is, you know, the simplicity and the transparency of the language that she uses. It just makes a lot of sense for the kids. It's not overwhelming to them or us. Um, especially her, her unique way of teaching dotted rhythms. I never encountered, encountered a teaching dots before, and we'll talk about more of that later on too. So here's a video clip of what we do on the first day of school. All right, one, two, three. One beat looks just like this. Make sure your foot's 
Ready? Do this with me. Think about it. Ready, set, and count it. Ready, go. One, two, three, four. Three is still 
there, but three is going to be silent. I'm not going to say it. Does anybody think that maybe they can count, measure, one? Remind me what your name is. Way in the back. Yeah. Evan. Evan. Evan, you can count that for us? Let's see. Evan, count for us. Just measure one. Ready, set, and ready, go. that is there's a lot of people, especially young teachers, that don't actually know how to start when you don't know anything. Um, and we wanted to just kind of give you a, just a quick way of, of how you can start when kids know virtually nothing or they're coming from multiple different elementaries uh, with different information. Um, like I said, there's a script in there. I actually wrote it the first year I was teaching and I studied it before every class period that I taught. And if it's helpful to you or some new teacher that you know, great. And if not, chunk it. Um, the thing that I like about how we do the first day of counting, and this is actually the second day of school, we are, um, the tone and the organization that we use when we're teaching counting really sets the standard for how our class runs. Um, you know, we're like the first class that's really doing anything, and everybody else is doing handbook junk, and we're already going with this stuff. It's very organized. It's very interactive. Um, I keep it super fast-paced. I try to be kind of silly with it so that they enjoy coming and doing this kind of stuff. And most importantly, though, we're wording it extremely logically. Yeah, so that was on the actual second day of school. So on the first day, we've gone through all our expectations, done everything. Second day, we start counting. It gives them urgency and excitement to get to the band hall every day. Um, and after the, the first day of counting, Alex and I actually start pulling kids in small groups into the back room and checking their instrument supplies. That way, um, we go through counting. We do take some counting breaks and we do uh, note name flashcards. We'll do like the first octave for each instrument and what the octave would be appropriate to them. And so we'll do breaks where they're doing flashcard races and that kind of thing. So by the time we actually split into instrument classes, the kids can count quarter notes, half notes, dotted halves, whole notes, eighth notes, and all their corresponding rests. They've had a test on their first octave of notes. Um, and we know that they have all their supplies. So we're not splitting into classes and there's like one kid that doesn't have stuff yet that isn't doing anything. Um, so everybody is totally ready to go. The kids actually feel like pros, yet they haven't touched an instrument. Um, so like they feel really good about what they're doing and they can literally just think about their face and their hands and everything they have to do for their instrument because they have this back knowledge on everything else that they need. So when we teach a new rhythm, we begin with two things. We have this silly, um, I don't know, it's a rhythm tree story. You'll see that being built in the video. It's also in your handout, too. Um, what we also have is this uh, in-depth note card chart. And, and each kid builds on their own. So they have four columns. As you see on the left side, they have the rhythm for the note. The next column is how many beats it gets. The next column is how many pulses. And the right column is the amount of rests. And that's just for them to keep in a pencil pouch and refer back to at any time. Um, and then once again, when we're teaching a new rhythm, we want the students to draw their own conclusions, conclusions and uh, build off what they already know. Um, sometimes it takes a long time for the kids to, you know, it takes several minutes or so for them to figure out how to count the rhythm. Then the long run is worth it. But sometimes it's actually fun to like watch them struggle a little bit. every uh, concept by asking them questions. Very rarely do I actually give kids information. In fact, really the only time I tell a kid the right answer or where we're going with this is that quarter note rhythm uh, lesson that we do on the second day of school. So by the third day of school, I'm ready to move on to other concepts. And we've got one of those charts like what we just showed you up on the board and we're building it together. And so on that third or the second day of counting, I say, okay, so to remind me what we did yesterday, we learned quarter notes and then they go through and they tell me everything they know about quarter notes and quarter rests. And I say, okay, so today we're gonna learn a new concept. Today we're gonna start talking about what we do if we wanted to combine notes into a new, uh, an, into a new note. And I always start with something super old, and so I say, okay, today we're gonna start with the world's most boring rhythm. Who can tell me how we're gonna write in the count for this? And a kid will raise their hand and say, we're gonna write big one, big two, big three, big four. And I say, all right, let's go through and let's count it together. And we all go, one, two, three, four. Awesome, that was great, and I really reinforced that we're doing this correctly. Okay, well today we're gonna go through and we're gonna combine 
these two quarter notes into one new note. So if I just combine two quarter notes into a new note, how many beats is it gonna get? And they're gonna count tell me that it's gonna get two beats. And I say, okay, does anybody know maybe from piano or violin what kind of note gets two beats? Well, of course, it's a half note. And if nobody tells me that, which is pretty rare, usually I have somebody that knows, then I'll go ahead and give them that information that it is a half note. And so I say, okay, well, if it gets two beats, then I can go and I can replace these two quarter notes with a half note, yes? And so we go through and we replace it. And I say, okay, so where did beat two go? Well, the kids can tell me that beat two has gone inside of the half note, so I need to change how I've written in my count. So instead, I'm gonna write it with a little two, and that's like a placeholder, we know it's there, but we're not gonna say it out loud. Okay, well, yesterday we learned that if I have a quarter note, and a quarter note gets one beat, then it's gonna get two pulses. One, two, two, three, four. So if a half note gets two beats, how many pulses will it get? Well, by the power of math, it's gonna get four. Okay, so it's gonna get four pulses. So then I go and I turn on the metronome and I literally just stand up by the board and I say, well, what would that sound like? And I wait for the kids to kind of process this on their own and then I'll start calling on volunteers or kids that are going to be voluntold that they're gonna count this for me. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually a kid will uh, count it for us correctly and it may take a couple of people. And when they do, we have a big celebration that they did a great job and then we all count it together. Now we've just learned a new note. And so I'll tell them, okay, go ahead and turn to chart two. And we need to write a little note definition on the top of chart two. So we say, okay, today we learned about half notes and half notes get two beats and half notes get four pulses. And a half note or a half rest looks just like this. And we'll do this at the top of every new chart that introduces a new note so that we have this little definition going on. And then I'll do the same kind of teaching like this for whole notes. Um, okay, and so then we go through and we've done half notes, we do whole notes, and now it's time for the fun stuff. Um, probably about six years ago, I had a teaching epiphany. And maybe some of you have had this epiphany, and if you have, I would love to meet you, because I haven't met anybody that's had this epiphany before. Um, but I decided that I was going to teach um, dots in kind of an algebraic way, because then it taught the concept as opposed to the notes. And maybe you do this. If you do, rock on. You're awesome already. Okay, so I go through, and on the day I teach dots, I say, today we're going to learn about something really weird. We're going to learn about a dot. And a dot does something very magical. A dot adds half the value of whatever it's dotting. And we've all heard this before. This is not new information for you. And so then I'll say it again with great dramatic pause. A dot adds half of whatever it's dotting. So let's say that we have something called a dotted four. Okay, the dot is gonna add half of what it's dotting. So the dot is going to add what? What's half of four? Two. Super easy. So a dotted four would get six beats. Okay, if it gets six beats, how many pulses is it going to get? Eight pulses. Cool. What if we had a dotted ten? What would that be? So they'll all say, somebody tell me the math behind it. Okay, ten plus five. This is going to get fifteen beats. How many pulses is it going to get? Thirty pulses. Wow. Okay. What if we had a dotted eighty? What would that get? Tell me the math behind it. Okay, so we've got 80 plus 40. This is gonna get 120 beats, and it's gonna get 240 of the most boring pulses you have ever counted. And they will totally remember this because it's silly and ridiculous. And I say, okay, now let's go smaller. What if I had a dotted two? What would the math behind that be? Okay, two plus one. So this note would get three beats. How many pulses would it get? It will get six pulses. That all makes sense? Well, so could I change this to a half note? And little light bulbs go on, and I say, turn to chart four, and now we write in our rhythmic definition at the top of our dotted half notes, um, and we'll go back and we review the concept of dots later when we get to dotted quarter notes too. After we do that, we get to uh, ties, and in our ties, when we first introduce them, we are doing them within measures, and they've been doing them already. I mean, you saw how we teach whole notes and half notes, and we do the same thing. We'll go with the world's most boring measure, we'll do our circle, and then instead of the circle, we'll erase the circle and replace it with a tie. We talk about that the number then becomes small, the exact same thing. Um, we are not tying over bar lines at this point because we're just teaching the concept. Um, some of them do ask why. We do it inside the, bar, inside the measure, which we'll get to in a second. Um, depending on where the brass classes are at that point, we will talk about a tie versus a slur. Um, most of our brass kids are still doing lip slurs, I play, you play style, so they haven't seen it written yet, but obviously that conversation needs to be addressed at some point. It just depends on the year and the kids. All right, so the whole reason that we put ties in this progression of our counting is because we're gonna use ties to secretly uh, introduce dotted quarter notes for us. 
So um, after we've gone back and reviewed how to count ties, how to write in the count for ties, we'll go through and we'll start with our super, super easy bass rhythm. And again, I'll say, who can tell me how to write it in? And the kids tell me, big one, big two, big day, big three, big four. Okay, so we're gonna add a tie in. We just learned that when we add a tie in, I have to change my count. What do I have to change? Okay, well that two is going to become a small two. And at this point, I start trying to pull out as much information about this particular tie as possible. And so I'll pull it off to the side. Okay, what kind of notes did we just tie together? We tied a quarter note to an eighth note. So tell me, how many total beats is this tie going to get? And they'll tell me the math. It's gonna be one plus a half. This tie is getting one and a half beats. Well, if it gets one and a half beats, how many pulses would it get? Three. So then we go back and we add it up here. Okay, this is gonna get one and a half beats. Terrible handwriting. And three pulses. Okay, well, in my count, I already show where two of my pulses are. And I'll even hold my fingers because it kind of shows that we got one missing in the middle. So what, where is my third pulse here? And I'll finally get a kid that tells me that I've got a little tiny teddy in there. And so then we start talking about, well, where is my foot on each of these? Where's my foot on the big one? Okay, down, where is it on the little tay? Where is it on the little two? Where is it on the big tay? And then I, again, I'll just turn on the metronome and I'll go over here, but this time, I actually will kind of mime it with my fake foot that I use with them. And so I'll say, what would this sound like? And I'm just over here going, just a little, little mime, and the kids will pick up on it. I don't have to really explain how to count that. We've already talked about it from an academic, from a logical perspective. And finally, it may take one person if it's clarinet class, it may take 10 people if it's low brass class, but somebody <laughs> will finally count it correctly. And when they do, we drill it, we drill it, we drill it, we drill it, because we all know that dotted quarter notes are a little iffy for some kids to count. Okay, so we've done this with ties. The next day, we'll come back and we will review this. But this time, I'm going to review what we learned about dots. And so I'll say, okay, you remember a while back we talked about dots. We're gonna go back and we'll review that. So who remembers when we had a dotted four, what was the math? Now, what would the band math be on that? And so we'll talk about this would be a whole note and it would be tied to a half note. So I could actually replace this with a dotted whole note. What about when I had, jumping the gun here, what if I had a dotted two? What would the math on that be? Two plus one, what's the band math on that? So they would tell me a half tied to a quarter. Okay, so that would be our dotted half note. What if I had a dotted one? What would the math on that be? One plus a half. Tell me the band math on that. Okay, so I have a one tied to an eighth note. Wait a second, have we seen this tie before? And they'll say, yeah, we did that yesterday. It's on chart eight. Okay, so when we have a, a quarter note tied to an eighth note, what kind of new note would that be? Well, that's gonna be a dotted quarter note. And so then I go back and I write that exact same tied rhythm that we learned yesterday up on the board and I say, who can remember what we, what we wrote for the count? Go back and check chart eight if you need it. So they'll go through and we have again, and I'm re a big stickler. They have to show me all three pulses. They have to literally write out all three pulses for me. I want them to know where everything is. Okay, we'll go back and we'll count it. And I say, well, what we just talked about is that when I have a quarter note tied to an eighth note, it's the same as a dotted quarter. So I can go back and replace this and it's gonna be the exact same thing, yes? And so then we'll go back and we'll count it. We'll turn to chart nine and chart nine has two lines at the top of it and they are written exactly the same except at the top line it's written with ties and on the second line it's written in with dots. And I'll say compare them and they'll tell me it's exactly the same. So we'll go through and we'll take that count that we had written with the ties and then we'll change it down to our dotted quarter notes. And we've already drilled it and we've already drilled it and we did all of that yesterday and it all applies and the kids aren't confused about it anymore. I'm going to show you um, how we do syncopation because that's where we go next. Okay, so again, we've already said we always go from something that the kids know. So on the day that we are adding um, syncopation in, I will start them with this bass rhythm. And some kid will raise their hand because they're genius and tell me that I write big one, big tay, big two, big tay, big three, big four. Awesome. We've already done ties. So I will add a tie right here and I'll ask the kids what happened to my count. And some kid will raise their hand and they'll say the tay became small. Awesome. Okay, so how many pulses are here? There are two. We counted. They're geniuses. We're so proud. Then I'll do my tie over here. 
they tell me that that tay is big. This tay becomes small. They count it again and again. They feel brilliant. And you know, we're, we're smarter than them. So we're going to do this now and like we're, we're bringing them to the water. We are going to then move the tie right here. And I say, okay, so now what do I do about my count? And because they just did it two other times, the two becomes small, the tay becomes big. Awesome. And then they count it. At that point, I will tell them, okay, so now we have a note that started on tay that had some pulses on it. We have a long note that's starting on tay. We're going to call that syncopation. And like I alluded to earlier today, we see things in patterns because we have been looking at it for a long time. These kids don't know to do that. So when we teach syncopation, we teach them to bracket the rhythm. Um, and it helps their eyes isolate that rhythm. So at this point, we would have them write in their bracket. They would do that. Um, now they see that this is a, a unit here. Okay, next step would be, okay, I have a kind of note that I can replace two eighth notes with. What kind of note can I replace them with? And we will pull this down to this rhythm. And I'll say, isn't that exactly the same? And they will say, yes, of course it is. We'll add our little bracket there. We'll do our big one, big tay, small two, big tay, big three, big four. On the top of our syncopation chart, we will give them a formula of our eighth note, quarter eighth, with the bracket. And we'll say, big number, big tay, small number, big tay. Um, and we all know also in syncopation, a lot of times we do have um, some separation in this right here. So we have had years where the kids get kind of silly and they'll actually count one tay, tay, three, four, and they do the arm and everything and they will not mess it up. They think it's hilarious. Um, so we will do this, we'll review it. A couple days later, we'll come back and we will add in an eighth dotted quarter. We will still do our bracket. We will still make sure that they're isolating it. Then we'll review those things. A couple days later, we'll come back and do a full measure syncopation. They think it's wildly fun because they are going from something that they know. So next we have a much shorter video on 16th notes. Um, hopefully you can see the board a little bit better. This is much later in the year after syncopation. We are going to learn something new. So uh, let's start with our review. Once upon a time, we had a what kind of note? Four. The whole note. How many beats did it get? Four. We got four beats. How many pulses? Eight. 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 And when I split that in half, I got two half notes. Two half notes. Each of those got how many beats? Two. Two. How many pulses? Four. four. And then I split that in half, and I got two what? Four notes. And each of those got how many beats? One. How many pulses? Two. Okay, and then I split that in half and I got two eighth notes. And each of those got how many beats? Half a beat. Half a beat. How many pulses? One. Okay, so let's just think logically. If I split my eighth notes, how many beats is this a kind of note? Pulse. Yeah, we'll get one quarter of a beat. And I'll just tell you right now, it's not going to get any pulses. You can't do a half a pulse. You can't go like a... You can't do a half a pulse. Okay, so today we are going to go through and we're going to split our eighth notes in half, the smarter things. So I'm going to take a set of enormous eighth notes. And if I was going to write in the count for those two notes, what would it be? I would write a, a one and a, a ten. Okay, so I'm going to split each of these eighth notes. So I'm going to split the first one. Then I'm going to split the second one. This one is still one. This one is still ten. Now the difference between 8th notes and 16th notes, the 8th note has one bar, the 16th notes are going to have two. Now this is still one, this is still tay, but now I need words for the other ones. So we're going to call this one T, and we're going to call this one top. Now where is my foot every time I have a number? Every time I have a number, my foot is down. Where is my foot every time I have tay? Up. And it still stays that way. So the T is on the way up and the taw is on the way down. You're not going to do anything different with your foot. It's just going to be on the way up and on the way down. So I'm going one. So that was one time in the spring. Let me turn this on. That was in the spring with the sax class. And uh, I just want to start off this section. This is percussion. I want to start off by saying that I am a percussionist to the core. I teach all percussion on our campus. I can see a lot of percussionists out in the audience. Um, I mean, I totally understand that percussion is a different beast altogether. Uh, I know a lot of percussion teachers who like to use a certain book, the Wessels book or the Wiley book. They like to use a certain counting system or rhythm system. And I get it, the rhythms are crazier and faster, especially much sooner. 
but I don't teach rhythm any differently to the beginning percussion class. I think it's very important to keep the same uh, style all the way through. Um, I teach and move through the counting charts the same exact way as the wind players. We use the same progression, we use the Eastman counting system. I think the only real difference is that we move much quicker than the winds. You know, we're through simple 16th notes in October where the winds might get there in the spring. So um, that's the only real difference. I'm a very firm believer that the best counting system is a consistent counting system, once again. So in the entire sixth grade year, we'll go through the charts and we'll play them on pad or keyboard. Um, you know, I'll teach them natural sticking that way. We'll go all on the left hand, double stops, any variations I can think of with, uh, with the charts on pad. Now when I got hired, I remember asking Darcy um, if I could possibly transition and introduce one end is to the seventh and eighth grade percussionists, not the sixth grade. And she said, well, as long as they can count and keep up in full band, I don't care. <laughs> so, cool. So I transitioned them and they can pretty much do both. I can, pay, I can say, you know, count that with 20 takeoffs or count that with one end, and they can switch back and forth. They actually really enjoy it. Um, we believe that it's crucial to the entire full band program that every student is using the same counting system for the culture, all right, that's a huge one. All right, so um, I'm going to, see, I don't need no mic. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read to you, but this is the page in your handout that says rhythm is the fundamental. And I do want to go through a couple of, of ways that we use charts that are not maybe the most obvious. Um, of course, we do count our charts. We, it is very rare occasion that we ever count a full chart. We're usually counting four to eight measures at a time. Um, and we don't always count in rows, because this is a great time to jack with their brains for your entertainment. Um, so while we don't always count in rows, sometimes I'll say, put your finger in the first measure and drag it down, and we'll count columns. Um, we count crisscross. I was able to do this the first week of school, where we literally diagonal our way down the page. And the kids think that is great fun, because it's weird. Um, I'll say only count the odd measures this time. We do a lot of duet counting where I'll have like say the girls count line one while the boys count line two and there's a billion different variations of that you can do. Um, we'll do pass around counting where group one counts the first measure, they pass it to group two who passes it back to um, group one and we're going down the page like that. Um, if I have a class that I feel like I can control enough we'll do scream counting. Um, and much better for trombones. Um, <laughs> we, we introduce tying of charts very early on, like by the second week of school. That's how we introduce articulation, is by going through and, and verbally tying or teeing um, the charts, depending on your instrument. Um, we count in arrows, especially when we get down to like dotted quarter notes. Um, we'll go through and count like down, up, down, up, down, down. And we get super silly with the up, because then they'll do it the right way. Um, of course, we do all of that other stuff that's on the page. Down um, with the playing, um, eventually we'll start having the kids play them backwards, where they start at the very last note and they play the entire line backwards. I do not recommend that you ask them to count it backwards because their brains explode. Um, but they do play them backwards in sixth grade. Um, and last year I started doing something with my trombone and flute classes where we were like melodic playing. We'd already been doing a ton of I play, you play, either on mouthpieces or on head joints, and I really needed a transition to get them to playing something that they were actually reading, but we weren't quite ready to do it in the book yet. So we started, uh, like we would go back to chart two, which is half notes and quarter notes, and I would say, okay, anytime you have a half note, it's gonna be your middle partial, and anytime you have a quarter note, it's gonna be your low partial. And that also allowed me to introduce um, going through different steps of learning songs. So now when we get to the traditional note name step, like my trombones are going middle, low, low, middle, and they're having to read the notes and they're having to think in their heads what the changes of notes are. They're having to think about their changes of stream. My flutes are doing this on their head joints and they're going high, low, low, and we're doing it on head joints, so they're having to think about embouchure changes, but it gives them something to read and continue reinforcing that rhythm while we're doing face work. Um, and then later on, we start doing, um, using the charts to uh, implement articulation, like Jenna's band is playing Broken Bow, and so they're working on their accents on using these charts. Um, just a billion different ways that you can use them. And when the kids get into seventh and eighth grade, the charts don't go away. These are in their binder all three years. Um, the high schools are starting to use them also. Um, and. There, I mean, you need rhythm to be able to do any of the fundamental exercises that you're doing. So this is something that is very fundamental to what they are doing every day anyway. 
Um, the way that we do our summer band for our seventh and eighth graders is they come to us the first two weeks of August. Um, the first week, well, we're split in bands, so each of us are seeing our own bands, but the first week we see woodwind, brass, percussion separately. The second week we have full band. Um, and we start on the charts because you all know that you have a kid that was sitting on their bed playing all summer and they're gonna look weird. And this is a great time for you to be looking just at their face while they're doing something super easy, making sure they haven't gotten any strange habits over the summer. Um, and it's just a really good reset for them too because they've been like mush for a couple of weeks. Um, then also, um, when we get them all together, we do it again because it's a really good thing just getting them used to playing with each other and hearing each other on something super easy. Uh, so you get lots of concert F, but you can change the note too because that's fun. Um, now this counting system makes a super huge difference, especially with our non-varsity and sub non varsity bands. Ooh, I can't talk. <laughs> Um, our varsity band kids are going to be able to do this stuff. Um, most of them are doing just fine. But our sub non varsity and non varsity kids, this makes really, really huge differences. Um, in our, like in my band in particular, I have the non varsity. Uh, this year, we did a pep rally in the second week of August. They did a festival of bands by themselves in September. They had a uh, fall concert, a winter concert, three pep rallies, and two elementary tours. And it was just the non varsity kids by themselves. They also learned all of the region audition music and I had almost 20 kids make district and we had kids in the sub non varsity make district. Um, and it, I really think that it's just because that big rhythm element was taken out of it. I mean, they, they know how to count it. It takes a huge step away from uh, getting to the other stuff in the music. Yeah, also in the, the full band setting, and this is true for all three of the bands. Every time we pass out a new song, we count it. You know, that's the first step in sixth grade on those easy central elements lines, and it never really goes away through the end of honors band. And so we'll pass out a new song to everybody at the same time, and we'll count it, or we'll count a big section of the song, and then we'll play it. Or we'll have certain sections count the song while some other sections play, because uh, that really is the foundation. Um, counting charts can also serve as a huge introduction to sight reading, like the entire process for seventh and eighth grade bands. Um, so we'll pick a couple lines, and then we'll have the kids maybe like think and finger through the counts, and then we'll play it. And we can talk about the process and kind of how that goes down. Um, so by the time they get to the big boy pieces, it's not that big of a deal. And it's super good practice for, for my third banders. So I think those easy counts, they get that confidence, so it helps a lot. The great thing about the way we do with counting um, is primarily the regularity and the wording that we use. Um, it, it really is teaching the entire program. Um, you know, the smart kids always get it. You don't have to worry about the smart kids. It's the every other kid that you're having to figure out what is going to make sense to them in their mind. Um, you know, it's one thing when my honors band shows up to their first sectional on region music and they've already figured it out. It's another thing when Alex has concert band kids showing up to their first sectional, having already figured it out on their own. You know, when a kid is musically fluent on their own, that gives you so much more time to take really okay music and make it something really, really great. Um, that's our show. If you have <laughs> questions for us, we are, we're happy um, to chat with you. Um, I see people in the audience that I recognize from a long time ago, so I hope you come and say hi. Uh, but thank you very much for coming. We super appreciate it. Thank you.